from our missionary Sean Evans from, uh, uh, let me see, Sierra Leone, that's where we're going to be tonight, uh, off just the eastern part of Africa, looking forward to hearing from him. Let me open up in a word of prayer, and then we'll watch uh, the missionary pray for him and get into the service. Father, I thank you again for tonight. Thank you, Father, for, again, all that you do. Father, I pray that you, we help, you help us to have open ears as we hear from our missionary, Father, and just the importance it is for us to be unified as people around this world are, are doing your will, and we have an opportunity to be a part of that by uh, our givings, but also in our prayer life. I pray that you would just uh, be with uh, uh, us now as we go through our service, and we thank you again for all that you do. We love you, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Good evening, and welcome once again to uh, Wednesday Around the World. We have tonight... Um, Wednesday over on the world, we have our missionary to Sierra Leone. We have Sean Evans. Sean, it's good good to have you uh, on today. It's great to see you, Neil. Great to see uh, well, I can Great to see you through the screen. <laughs> yes, this past year has been a whirlwind for a lot of people, uh, missionaries, yeah. and um, and we're so glad that. And and for you specifically, I mean, you were just transitioning to the field whenever all this stuff kind of went down, right? Yeah, I mean, we were, you know, it was. It was kind of funny how it all worked out. We were, man, when the when the whole lockdown hit, I mean, we were we were scheduled, we were on track to be on the field in September of that would have been of 2020. And yeah. then COVID, we pushed everything back. But you know, God opened doors for us and put us in places we wouldn't have been otherwise. And and everything in his timing was just so, so perfect in us getting to the field. So it was kind of a, you know, I don't like using this term when it comes to COVID or anything it was kind of almost like a blessing in disguise almost yeah. I don't, no yeah. I don't know of a better way to say it for sure for sure now you were with us two years ago um two years ago this June in fact 
just last month or a couple months ago, but uh, we, we wanted to ask you a few questions. And obviously you're probably not our newest missionary, but, um, but you are one of our missionaries. This is, um, and so we had, uh, we wanted to ask you a few questions about, uh, about your kind of transitioning to the field, if we could. Um, the first question was this, is who was pivotal in your life in you surrendering to the Lord? Um, so who, who was that? Who was the individual? Well, it's kind of a combination. Um, you know, our, our home and sending church is a, is a very um, a great commission focused, mission minded church. And so, you know, we've been exposed to missions for, for several years and missionaries coming through and things like that. Um, but then it wasn't really until I got really involved in discipleship at our local church. And uh, one of our staff pastors, he's a, he's a close friend of mine. I consider him a mentor as well. He um, had, a long, had a huge influence in my life. And um, it was really just going through discipleship mm. and then um, and just continuing to grow and faithfully serving. And then we went on missions trips, participating in outreach. And, and, the, and the more we got involved in those areas, the more um, the Lord began to really facilitate in our hearts uh, a desire to to serve him in a, in, a, in a larger capacity, I guess you could say, as far as going yeah. deep foreign missionaries. Now, somebody uh, is looking at going to the field. They're, they're wanting to be a missionary. How would you encourage them um, going through this whole process that you've just, I mean, really within the last couple of years, you've gone through? How can you, how can you give some encouragement to them? Well, I think you said, you, you hit on it just a minute ago when you said, um, you used the word willing, um, just when we were speaking just a minute ago. And it was, uh, I think willingness and availability are mm -hmm. your two, are your two big things. So when I look at when I look at the disciples and I and I look at Jesus Christ and and you know it started out where he told the disciples come and see you know come hey just come come check out and then and then he and he challenges them to to follow him uh, to Peter and Andrew and they dropped their nets and they followed him and when Matthew did the same thing it wasn't that you know necessarily that they gave up everything they ever knew and then all of a sudden just on the spur of a moment decided to follow Jesus. They knew that in order to follow him, some things were going to have to change in their lives. And to really do that, they had to reprioritize their lives. So for Peter and Andrew, it was um, it, it was giving up their their fishing business. Now, that doesn't mean they never fished again. I mean, sure, they liked it. I'm sure they liked to fish, but they had to reprioritize their lives. So one, they had to be truly willing, but you have to be available at the same time. And in order to be available to be used by God. Um, you have to reprioritize some things and always re you have to remember that, you know, God's will for all of us is the same. I mean, it, it, it's in his word, God, God's plan for your life and his will is never going to be separate from his word. Yeah, for sure. Um, so just that constant steadiness of doing what God would have you to do. Um, so somebody maybe, and maybe this, I don't know, goes against what, what you just said. I, I really would love your insight. So if somebody couldn't go to the field, so I mean, with what you just said, I mean, kind of, we all have the capability of going to the field. Um, mm -hmm. But would you, would there be an encouragement of you say, maybe, um, or how would you answer that? So if somebody would say, I, I don't feel necessarily called to the field, um, how what word of encouragement could you give them? Now with the willingness and availability, you know, when I talk about that, I'm not even necessarily always talking about it as a being a foreign missionary aspect. You know, that's mm. wherever you're at. Yeah. So when you're talking, when we're talking about missions, and I know we're talking about global missions. You know, we're in a foreign country sure. from our own country, and we're taking the gospel to the to the uttermost parts of the earth and all those things. Well, there's also you, the Great Commission is the same for all of us. It doesn't matter whether you're um, sitting in your local church in the U.S. or wherever. The only difference between the, the missionary on the foreign field and the, and the believer back home is, is location. It's not mission objective. So you have to be willing to be used in your local church. You know, and if you're not going to serve him and, and participate in evangelism in your community and, 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 uh, and have the as you're going mentality of reaching people for Jesus Christ, being willing and available to do those things, then how's God going to be able to use you for anything greater if you're not going to do just the simplest of things of, hey, our church is having an outreach event tonight. You know, I need to re I need, I, I want to help. I want to be willing to go share the gospel, but I've got to reprioritize some things with my time so that I can participate in that. And you're, and you're in essence being a missionary in your own, 
area. So participating in those things, then obviously if you can't, if your desire is to go to the foreign field, but for some reason you can't, you know, one, you, you can do the great commission right where you're at, yeah. but then also, yeah. but then also, you know, praying for missionaries, sending emails to them or whatever modes of communication to be an encouragement, then always, you know, then there's giving, giving toward missions. I mean, there, there's ways to participate in foreign missions. And if yeah. you, maybe you can't go full time, but go on a mission trip. If you're, if the church is offering, Hey, we're going on a mission trip to, you know, Nicaragua or somewhere like that. See if you can go. Yeah. I love that. I love how that you brought that back. It's not, it's not about in essence of, of you going globally. Um, but it's in the essence of you starting out near Jerusalem and your Judea. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then, and then from there, who knows what God may call you. Um, and I love that. I love how, cause it is so true. Sometimes we think, mm-hmm. Oh, I can't go here, but what can you do? You can do something. And so God desires us to, to go. I, I really appreciate your, your feedback for that. We want to be able to um, pray with you guys more specifically. And I know it was so exciting. So uh, to be able to see uh, your letter as you, you guys had such a positive response um, for that showing of the Jesus film. But um, there are things I know that you're trying to accomplish and that we want to be a help with. What can we, or how can we pray more specifically for uh, you, Kristen, and the family uh, for you maybe a few ways? Um, well, well, one is you know, our family still, you know, the, that, that culture is so opposite of everything we know. So there's always that, that constant adjustment and, 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 you know, our kids are, are, are a little bit older, you know, they didn't grow up on the mission field. They grew up in, in America and, you know, my, my, I got one daughter in high school and two in junior high now. And so, you know, we kind of came onto the field. So there's just those transitional things that are just, you know, constantly, we're, we're, we're battling just with the culture yeah. and things like that. And um, the, the other is so pray, praying for those things, praying for, um, you know, wisdom uh, in our family and, and helping, helping our children adjust and ourselves too, taking, making sure we don't get so caught up in, in all the distractions that we, that we forget that, Hey, let's, let's take some time for our family and just go, you know, uh, take, just take some time to, to, to step back for a minute and try to yeah. find those things to, to, to um give it to, to refresh us a little bit yeah. um and then the, the, and then the other is you know we're we're planning we're trying to uh we're in the process of trying to find some property and um we want to buy a, a a large piece of property that where we can construct a church building and a discipleship right. training center and then we also want to um, be able to start a, a soccer sports ministry um, on that. So we want to be able to have a soccer field because it's soccer is so big there. Sure. And, um, and uh, a lot of times they don't have a lot of places that they can even play. What an outreach opportunity, man. If you were to roll sure. a soccer bill out on soccer ball out onto an open field, man, you'd have so many people out there wanting to play. So it's a great outreach opportunity that we can connect back to the church. And so, we'd like to, to find a piece of property and begin that process within the next year or so. Um, Cause right now I'm pastoring a church that's already been planted. Um, and uh, we're trying to, we just got an associate pastor there. So I'm trying to work with him and hoping that, that he can, he'll be able to, to soon be able to take over the, take over that church so that we can try to go plant one in an area that's really growing right now. And there's no churches there. Um, so it'd be, gotcha. so we're kind of going that direction. Well, thank you so much for your time. Um, as our time has come to an end, we really appreciate you and um, Kristen and and, um, and and your family. And thank you for allowing us to really be a part of your lives and uh, serve the people of Sierra Leone and share the gospel with them. It, it's been quite a privilege and we're very thankful and appreciative of you guys for letting us be a part of your lives. Now, nah, thank you guys. We love you all. And um, man, it's always so, in, so encouraging. We keep up with what you're doing, you know, thank you know, one of the blessings of technology is being able to kind of keep up with a little bit of what's going on and some of our uh, ministry partners. And we're always excited to see what you guys are doing. We love you all and uh, we have fond memories of being with you and, and uh, looking forward to, to one day coming back and giving a report, getting to, getting to see some familiar faces, man. Love you all. Appreciate you. Appreciate the prayers and, uh, and your faithfulness. Let's pray for the Evans family and what they're doing in Sierra Leone. Father, we come to you and we thank you again that we can lift up these requests to you. Father, as we heard from our missionary, and Father, it's just 
a wonderful thing that we can bond together with our missionary and hear his heart uh, for the people there and just the, some of the struggles and some of the issues that uh, they're going through to be able to do your will. We, we lift these up to you now. We pray, Father, for the Evans. We pray, Father, that you help them give wisdom as they balance starting a ministry there along with family and to be able to uh, bond together and get adjusted to a brand new uh, country and an area that they need to be familiar with. And I pray, Father, as their kids are older now, I pray you help them to adjust and that they would uh, be able to just do a great work there. And I pray that you'd bind Satan from them. I pray you keep them healthy. And I pray, Father, you'd work in their lives. And then, Father, he's also been ask, asking prayer about uh, constructing, getting a property and constructing a building and being able to discipling people and just being able to, to see a work grow there uh, from basically nothing. Uh, talking about an area that has no church at all and opportunities to reach people and, and a heart to be able to reach and see people saved. And I pray, Father, that you will again do a great work through that family and uh, being able to reach people there and to be able to see people saved and discipled. And I pray, Father, that you would open doors for uh, a property to be uh, purchased at a very inexpensive price to be able to build a, a, a building there. And uh, we'll hear after another year that things are going in that direction. And we just are so thankful for what you'll do. Thank you, Father, for him. Thank you, Father, for our missionaries around this world and that you'd work in a mighty way in their lives. We love you and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, why don't we stand? We are going to sing a song. And at that end, we will take an offering leaning on the everlasting arms. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. to dread, what have I to fear, leaning on the everlasting arms, I have blessed peace with my Lord so dear, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning. Everlasting arms. Amen. Well, let's go to the uh, Lord and ask the Lord to bless the offering, and then right after that, Pastor will come up and deliver the word. Let's pray. Father, we love you, and I thank you again for all that you do. Thank you, Father, for again meeting our needs. We thank you, Father, for meeting the needs of this ministry, and I pray, Father, that you would continue that even tonight now. Bless those that give. We love you again. Thank you again for all you do. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. Thank you. Oh, take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 6, if you would. Matthew chapter, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 16. Our topic is beware. Two weeks ago, we started a series called Beware. Do you have that good? You got them up there? Beware. Years ago, uh, when Jonathan, my oldest grandson, who is now in college in ROTC and uh, uh, becoming a man's man, and uh, uh, I, I took him and a couple of our other grandchildren... We were up at, We went to Tule Springs, which is a which a park out a Floyd Lamb State Park, and uh, there's there's the nice part of Floyd Lamb State Park. It's nice green trees and flowers and nice things and grass and but th- there's another part of Floyd Lamb State Park that a lot of people don't know about. You can walk out into the desert. There's these old bushes and there's their mesquite bushes and they they built up and and years ago I took my kids out there. We used to ride bikes out there and do stuff on the back side where nobody ever goes, and we would just have fun. People have ridden horses out there. There's horse trails and that kind of stuff. So I took Jonathan, I took Savannah, and I took uh, just a couple other grandkids, and I thought, oh, let's, we're just going to have some fun, just doing some kids stuff, you know? And uh, we, as kids, always had imaginative things, and so I said, come on, let's go over here. We went over to these mesquite trees, and there's just bushes and bushes and bushes of them, and you can make tunnels through those mesquite trees. Now, you've got to, have a, got to have a little kid's heart, and so I said, I said, okay, kids, this is what we're going to do. Let's get down, and let's start making tunnels. And we started crawling through uh, these great big mesquite bushes, and we're crawling through. I said, now, you've got to be very careful, because we're on a safari. And, and, uh, uh, and, and Jonathan said, what? So what's a safari? I said, it's where we look for animals. And we're looking, and I'm down on my knees, and they're, they're, we're going through, and I said, we, we're looking for, uh, for like lions and tigers and bears. Oh, me. Uh, we were, and we were, we're, we're going through, and I, he said, really? I said, yeah, watch out. There's all sorts of animals here. And he said, why, Grandpa, are we here? Like, you're some kind of nut bringing me to this place. And I said, well, this, we're, we're going to have fun. No, I think it's best if we just turn around and leave right now. Uh, it's amazing what we, what, what, uh, we uh, face and things that are all around us. The Bible says this in James, or in, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and you're not turning there, but 2 Timothy chapter 3 says this. It says, um, I'll turn there because I can't remember what it says. <laughs> I'll misquote it. I'm just coming through my memories here. So, the Bible says in the last days, perilous times shall come. Perilous times shall come. And I'm going to get there and I'm going to read it to you. It says, For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affections, truce breakers, false accusers. This is our world today. Incontinent, that is lacking self-control. Fierce, despisers of those that are good. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God. In a culture like that, we need to beware. Fourteen times in the New Testament, the word beware is used. There are things that God wants us to be cautious about. And when men begin to reveal the hidden sin within them, and they become very vocal about their wrong being right, as we, as we see in our world today, the Bible tells us we need to beware. The Bible says they're, they're going to be traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And then the Bible says this, very interesting, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such, turn away. These wicked, evil, self-centered, self-righteous people are going to have a form of godliness. They're going to be telling you that they're right and you're wrong. And that they're spiritual and you're not. And, and, and we live in that day. And we need to understand that we live 
in that day. The Bible says in the last days, and the last days started at Pentecost. We live in a time of wickedness. Now, last week, we, or two weeks ago, we started. Last week, we were uh, in, the, in the Maximize Life Conference, but, but two weeks ago, we started, and we said there's ser- several things that God says in the New Testament that we are to beware of. The first thing that we saw last week, or two weeks ago, was beware of false prophets. Now, I, want you to, I just want to review this very carefully, and what I'm sharing with you today is so important. The word prophet means to proclaim truth or to be a proclaimer. The idea is like of reporters today. We think of the prophet in, in, in the sense of speaking God's truth. But a prophet is somebody who proclaims truth. Or if it's a false prophet, they proclaim lies as truth. And we are surrounded with people like that. We're to beware of false prophets. They, they dress like sheep. They, they're, 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 they're not saved, though they claim to be saved. You can tell, the Bible says, and this is very, very important, you can tell a false prophet by his fruits. You can tell a false prophet. How can I tell if somebody's a false prophet? We talked about this again two weeks ago. How can I tell a false prophet? You can tell him by his fruits. Just like you can tell a true prophet by his fruit. Uh, look, look at this. A true prophet has the fruit of the Spirit. And in your notes, you'll see what the Bible says about the fruit of the Spirit. Now, what I'm saying is this. If somebody is truly a prophet from God, a preacher from God, if a preacher, could, if you want to know, how can I trust this preacher? How, how can I know if I can trust this preacher or I can't trust this preacher? How can you tell, how can you look at me and say as a preacher, hey, can I trust him? Or, or any other preacher, the people that you listen to on, on the radio, the people that you listen to on television. I was listening to a preacher the other day And as I was listening to him, uh, I thought, whoa, this guy is a false prophet. And I'll tell you why in just a few minutes. Look, you can tell a false prophet, and here's here's how you can tell. First of all, let's look at a a true prophet, a true prophet. The Bible says you're going to be able to tell him by the fruit. He's going to have the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 and 23 says, but the fruit of the Spirit, now look, is love and joy and peace and long-suffering, and gentleness, and goodness, and faith, and meekness, and temperance. Against such there's no law. Look, a a true prophet is when he preaches, out of his life is going to come these qualities. But not only that, the people he touches with the message of God, the true message, it's going to produce in their life this fruit. You understand that? You're going to see this kind of fruit, this kind of result out of a person who is a prophet, a true prophet of God. In James, the Bible says this, who is a wise man? How can I tell a wise man that's endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation. That is his lifestyle. You'll be able to look at his lifestyle his works with meekness, does he walk in meekness? That is, does he show dependence upon God? Uh, uh, he gives his wisdom by depending upon God. But the wisdom that is from above, now listen, how can I tell if the, his wisdom is from above? It's first pure, that is, there's, no, there's not any corruption in his mouth. I, I was reading a, a preacher who was very highly esteemed, this is about 30 years ago, I was reading an article, and he said in this article, he said, man, he said, I was a Marine one time, and he was talking about another individual. He said, I, was, I, was, I used to be a Marine. He said, and, and if I could talk like I thought, as a, like I'm thinking as a Marine, I'd have a, some choice words to say. And I thought, man, you don't have a pure heart. Your heart isn't pure. Listen to what's coming out of their mouth. It's, the wisdom is first pure. Then it's peaceable. This isn't try, someone trying to cause contention. Gentle and easy to be entreated. Full of mercy. You, that is, you can come up to this prophet and you can ask questions and he's not going to get back in your face. Full of mercy and of good fruit. Without partiality. He doesn't treat one person different than another. Without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. 
This guy's a peaceful person. He may speak truth, and it may be harsh truth, but he is not there to hurt or to, to cause problems. Now look, how do I tell a false prophet? A false prophet will produce the works of the flesh. Remember, Jesus said, by their fruit you shall know them. What are the works of the flesh? Are manifest, which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft. That, that, I think, is the word pharmaceutical, which means drug abuse. Hatred. I was with a preacher one day, and he said, he said excuse me, stop. i got to stop and take a happy pill. I thought, maybe you're not too happy. Um, hatred, variance. Emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murder, drunkenness, reveling. A, a preacher that is preaching that is not of God, a false prophet, will, will out of his life, you, you hear about a preacher, oh, that preacher, oh, man, he was so tremendous. How come he went out and had an affair? Oh, there was that great preacher and he died and we find out that he had all sorts of immoral things going on. What was he? He was a false prophet. Well, I, what I, uh, all these things, man, when I hear that preacher preach, I, it makes me just want to get up and punch somebody. It's not com- coming from above. Listen, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murder, drunkenness, revelings, and a such like of, uh, of, of which I tell you before, as I have told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. There are people, there are preachers on the internet that say things and do things that just stir strife. Now, I don't care who they're stirring strife about. That's not what a preacher from God does. It just makes my blood boil when I hear him preach. Well, then you're maybe not listening to the right preacher. James says this. James says this. But if you have bitter envyings and strife in your heart, Glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. What I'm saying is this. Whether the guy calls himself a, uh, a preacher, or whether he calls himself a news commentator, or what, whether he calls himself a liberal activist or a conservative activist, if when he stands up and begins to speak to you, it makes you want to do something bad to somebody else. It makes you want to, I mean, listen, by, by virtue of who I am in my flesh, there are some politicians that I don't like to look at and I don't like to watch because I, I don't need anybody to tell me to dislike them. I just naturally dislike them because of their philosophical views or because of their political agenda. I don't like it. I don't need somebody, Kyle, stirring my heart to want to go and punch the person or do something terrible to them. I need to understand that that I need to be careful about who I'm allowing to put stuff in my mind because words do things. They don't, they don't just mean things, they do things. And if we're listening to false prophets, false proclaimers, people who are proclaiming lies and saying that this is truth, then we can be led astray. We can be led astray in our doctrine as Christians. We can, be, we can, we can walk away from God. We can, we can be led astray in how we conduct ourselves. And we need to be careful about that. And so Jesus warned, number one, you beware of who you're listening to. You beware of who you're listening to. Somebody comes into the church and they say, well, we just want to check this place out for a little while. I think, good. Come into this church, you're new, you need to check this place out. You need to be careful about who you're listening to, whether it's here or someplace else. If you're going to another, another town, you're leaving and moving to, to another town, man, I would warn you, be careful of who you're listening to. Be careful about who you're listening to on the radio and the television. And, and, and I mean, there, we have a radio, pro, we have a radio uh, station because we want you to be fed the word of God. But we need to be careful. You need to be careful. And, and understand that the marks of a false prophet. Take that sheet 
home with you and read through that again. That's what he says a false prophet is. Now, the second thing that I want you to see is in Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, there God warns us again to be careful. In Matthew, or or I'm sorry, to beware. Matthew chapter 16, he says this. And verse 6. Then Jesus said unto them, take heed and beware. That is, sit up, pay attention, and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. My wife made some homemade bread tonight. And she put some leaven in there and it puffed it all up. That leaven spread throughout there and that bread, that bread popped up in the bread maker and you walk into the house and the first thing you smell is that bread. And I had to wait because my, my son-in-law was coming over and my grandkids were coming over and I couldn't touch the bread uh, that was smelling so good and, uh, until they got there. I don't even think it was done, but, but uh, the... the uh, uh, it, it puffed it up, that leaven. That You put a little bit of leaven in a piece of bread and it goes throughout the entire loaf. So here's what he says. He says, now, now Jesus has just fed 5,000 and he's fed, he's, he's, he's fed thousands of people with bread. But here's, here's what happens. Jesus says unto his disciples, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He's not just talking about Pharisees, but the Sadducees. And the Bible says, and they reasoned among themselves, saying, uh, it's because we have taken no bread. He, uh, he's upset that we didn't get the bread, and we didn't get it here, and now he's hungry, and he's upset about that. Which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason you among yourselves, because ye have bought no bread? This has nothing to do with bread. Do you not understand, neither remember the five loaves and the 5,000 and how many baskets you took up? Don't you realize I had enough that I can take care of physical bread? Neither the seven loaves and the 4,000. With seven loaves, we fed 4,000 people. And how many baskets did you take up? Look, you don't have to worry about that. How is it that you do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread, but that you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? So he says, what I want you to do is beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. What are you talking about when you're talking about the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Then understood they how that he bade them not to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine. Beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. That's what I want to talk about for the next 22 minutes. We're going to talk about what it means when Jesus says, beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees. What was their doctrine? What was it that he wanted them to beware of? What was the thing that he didn't want to have them learn from the Pharisees? So we're going to look very quickly through the notes this evening. Father, help me to to communicate the truth that's here. God, it's so important. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would work and impress these truths on our hearts, and I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. The first doctrine of the Pharisees that we need to be aware of is the doctrine of hypocrisy. In Luke, you'll see these, and we're just gonna go through these notes. In Luke chapter 12 and verse one, the Bible says, in the meantime, when they were gathered together, an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, they were really anxious to see him, he began to say to his disciples, First of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, and he identifies what the leaven is. He says, which is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. Listen, God wants us not to pretend that we are something that we are not. And that can happen in the life of individuals as they grow in the Christian faith. We know what we're supposed to be, We know what people expect us to be, and so we act in accordance even though we know that's not who we are. You know what what will 
will drive your kids far, far away from Jesus Christ is your hypocrisy. You pretending that you're something at church and you're not that same person at home. When you are not who you pretend to be, it will drive them away. I want you to understand this. The world is sick of hypocritical Christians. In fact, the world will say, well, I'm not going to church because that place is filled with hypocrites. My response is, well, why not join us? Uh, you know, but that's a, that, and that may be a cute response, but the reality is this. Look, uh, uh, God wants us to be genuine. God wants our lives to be real. And God wants to show, God wants us to walk with him. That's why we're talking about walking with Jesus on Sunday morning. Let your life be genuine. Let your life be real. When you mess up, don't, the, the world, you know what the world does? The world covers up their sin and hides it. What we're supposed to do is confess our sin. And then he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us on, of all unrighteousness. Don't be hypocritical. That is a doctrine of the Pharisees. When you looked at the Pharisees, everybody said, look at them. They're so spiritual. They're so righteous. I could never be like them. And God would say, good, don't be like them. Because it's all fake. It's all show. Second thing he says is this. In, in, uh, it, the second thing we need to be aware of, the doctrine of the Pharisees, is malice and wickedness. Now listen to this. Let, let's read in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 9. It says, your glory in is not good. Know you not that a little leaven, he's talking about this leaven, leaveneth the whole lump. Purge out therefore the old lemon, uh, leaven. What is this old leaven? That ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast not with, now listen to this, listen, not with old leaven, neither the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. There's a big difference between what, between the person who's loving God and living for God and genuinely trying to be what God wants them to be and the guy that's faking it for some reason, wanting to put on a religious show. The, the, the false religion of the Pharisees, the hypocrisy of the Pharisees stirred up anger towards others. The word malice means anger or bitterness towards others. Look, if I am to be what God wants me to be, then I don't need to be involved in things that stir up strife in other people. Look, there's a lot of people that disagree with what I do. They disagree with what I teach. They disagree with what we do here. I don't need to be angry at them. They're not my enemy. Kyle, my enemy fell from heaven, and he's going to burn in hell forever. And in between those times, Steve, he's out to get me just like he's out to get you. But he wants me to think that you're my enemy and, that, and forget about the reality of the, in the spiritual realm that he's out to get me. And that he's out, the same guy that's after me, John, is after you. That's reality. And I don't, I'm not going to allow myself to get upset with somebody, even if they get mad at me. Even if they're screaming at me, I'm not going to try to be cute and, and smile at them to get them madder at me. And you know, some of you can do that. My sister used to do that to me. My sister could make me so mad. I'd get so mad. And she'd say, oh, is Davy mad? Oh, that's horrible. It's hor anyway, I, but I don't have any malice towards her. <laughs> Stirring anger towards others. That's what, that's what the Pharisees did. They did that towards Jesus because he wasn't walking to, according to their rules. That's doing anything. Look at what is wickedness. Wickedness is doing anything you have to do to come out on top. I don't care. I'll do whatever I have to do. I'll do whatever I have to do. A few years ago, after a, an election, one politician from this state was asked, 
Well, you know, you lied. You lied. It's right here. You lied. And he looked boldfacedly and said, well, we won, didn't we? Wow. Listen, that can be true of lost people, but it should never be true of you. Jesus said, listen, I don't want my followers to be followers who, that, that, that say, hey, look, whatever you need to do to win, just do whatever you need to do. Look, hypocrisy is not what God wants for your life. He doesn't want you, that's the doctrines of the Pharisees, the doctrines of malice and wickedness. And then the Pharisees did this. They demanded signs. Pharisees demand signs. Look, in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 1, the Bible says the Pharisees also and the Sadducees came tempting, desiring him that he should show them a sign. Wow. People are really strange in their spiritual talk. Well, I don't know if, what God wants me to do. I'm, I'm just waiting for a sign from God. I've heard preachers say, as they're, <laughs> preachers, preachers say, I can tell you, a preacher, he said, I didn't know whether I should go to a certain place or not, and I was driving down the road, and he said, uh, I fell asleep at the wheel. It's a true story. I fell asleep, according to him. I, I fell asleep at the wheel, and he said, he said, all of a sudden I heard horns honking, and I, I, I put on my brakes, and I almost smashed into the back of the truck. And he said, there on the back of the truck, Right in front of me, my headlights were shining on it. It's, it had the name of the city that I was praying about, and I knew that that's where God wanted me to go. You know what that is? Stupidity. That's, no, that's not a sign. I mean, that's, that God does, look, the guy says, I don't know what God wants me to do, so I'll open my Bible. Judas went and killed himself. Oh, no, that can't be the one. Can't be the one. Go thou and do likewise. No, 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 that can't be it. If you try to get God's direction in your life by seeking a sign, you need to understand that's what the Pharisees wanted. We have, we have groups of people, and I love, I, I love all of our brothers and sisters in Christ, but I'm telling you, there's some people who are just waiting for weird signs. You can go on the internet and you can hear some strange people saying strange things that happen. And I've got some brothers, I love them dearly, but they're, they, they're waiting for strange signs, and they get strange signs, and they're just doing, they're doing, uh, they're, they're looking for the wrong thing. Look, you know what you need to get? You need to get an understanding of the Word of God. Say amen to that. Amen. So th the Pharisees were waiting for signs. You are, you are living in the doctrine of the Pharisees if that's what you, I'm waiting, I'm just waiting for God. Look, I love what Sean said tonight. He said, God's called us all. We should all be doing something. I don't need to wait for a sign. Jesus said, go ye therefore and teach all nations. If you're not gonna go over to Sierra Leone, then do something in Las Vegas. Can you say amen to that? Why? Because Jesus said, go into all the world, starting in your Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. You're, you realize we're at the uttermost parts of the earth in Las Vegas, Nevada? If you look at where Jerusalem is, and you look at where we are, we're uttermost. So let's go out and tell people about Jesus. We have no excuse. We're not waiting for a sign, waiting for Jesus to come and tap me on the shoulder and say, go out door knocking. That would scare the daylights out of you if that happened. Just go out and tell somebody about Jesus. Get involved. October 17th is coming. Go out and get somebody. Don't wait for a sign. Let me tell you another thing that, that the doctrine of the Pharisees did. It always contradicts Scripture. It contradicts Scripture. Look what the Bible says in Matthew. And again, uh, here it, it, Jesus is saying, he says, for God commanded, saying, honor your father and your mother. And, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But you say, and that's this it. The word of God may say something, but if I don't feel it or if I don't sense it, then, oh, but you say. Jesus said, but you say, whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, it's a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Now, what's that, what's that all about? The law said honor. The idea of honor here is financially take care of your parents. In the Jewish system, the Jews 
took, uh, parents took care of their kids. They pr- provided a business. The business was there. And then when they got too old to, to do, run the business, they tor- turned it over to their children. Their children were to honor their parents and take care of them until they went to heaven. That was the idea. Honoring your parents was to financially take care of your parents because they financially took care of you and brought you up and now you have a responsibility to take care of them. Well, by Jesus' time, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were saying, look, if you want to take that money that you were supposed to take care of your parents with and give it to the temple, give it to us, trust us with it, you can say to them, it's a gift. We don't need to take care of you. We've given it to God. And and he's saying, you have just discounted, you've just contradicted what the scripture's saying. And it sounds so spiritual. Oh, I gave it to God. I gave this money to God. But your parents are starving. And they took care of you all their life. Your responsibility, according to scripture, is to your parents first. Wow. Look. He says, Jesus says, thus you have made the commandment of God of non-effect by your traditions, you hypocrites. Well said Isaiah, the prophet to you, saying, this people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching that for doctrines the commandment of men. They were saying this is doctrine, and they were just commandments they made up themselves that contradicted the law of God. The doctrine of the, of the Pharisees. Beware of this. Another thing is this. The doctrines of the Pharisees make it difficult to get to heaven. Makes it difficult to get to heaven. The idea is salvation by works. Somehow, salvation by works. Jesus said, but woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. You shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them to go in. What is he saying? He said, you make it so difficult to get to heaven. There's a lady that came to our church years ago. She said, she just always said, pray for my husband that he'll get saved. Pray for my husband that he'll get saved. We had the opportunity to go and talk to him, and her husband finally got saved. It was great. Bowed his head, trusted Jesus as his Lord and Savior. Now, this lady was a reader. In fact, she worked in a bookstore. She was a reader, 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 reader. So when she got saved, she was reading the Bible. I mean, like, it's like, read the Bible. What did you, you do yesterday? Yesterday I read the Old Testament. Uh, New Testament is today, and uh, tomorrow I'll go back to the Old. Uh, you know, that's, I mean, that's just, she was a reader, a reader, a reader. On the other hand, her husband was tactical, he wasn't a reader. He, doesn't, he did things. Man, but he was in church. He learned by listening. He was in church all the time, all the time. Find a place to serve. Cared about people. Loved people. I, I, uh, uh, he passed away. And I went to her house. And she said, I'm so glad you came by. She said, I'm so concerned. She said, I'm not sure that he ever got saved. I said, what do you mean? Well, you know, he had no passion to read the Bible. I thought, man, he practiced the Bible a whole lot more than you do. I didn't say that to her. I just thought it. And she, I, I said, what do you mean? She said, well, I would try to get him to read the Bible, and he just wouldn't read the Bible. He was in church Sunday morning. He was in church Sunday night. He was in church Wednesday night. Anything we ever asked him to do, he would do, because his heart was out to do, but he was a tactical learner. He didn't like to read. And he didn't have a cassette player, as far as I know, so he couldn't, couldn't and, he, and there was no iPhones. He didn't, and I said, I looked at her and I said, let me share something with you. I said, do you realize for the first 1,400 years of Christianity, nobody read the Bible? What? I said, nobody read the Bible for 1,400 years except the preacher in the church, if they had one, because there was no printing press. Do you think for 1,400 years, all those people who got saved that didn't read the Bible weren't really saved? She said, I never thought about that. 
Listen, just because somebody doesn't do it exactly the way you do it, they, not, they don't think just exactly the way you think, or they don't learn just exactly the way you learn, doesn't mean that they're not saved. Why do we make it so difficult to be saved? Jesus said this. I'm sorry, Jesus didn't say this. John said this. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. Now listen how simple this is. Even to them that believed on his name. That doesn't make it difficult. God doesn't make it difficult for us to get there. Well, somebody asked me the other day, don't you think that people need to repent? I do. I do. Repentance is absolutely necessary. But do you realize we have a false definition of repentance that's flying all over the world, all over the internet, all over everywhere? The word repent in the Bible simply means this. The Greek definition of the word repent is to change your mind. Now somebody over the centuries has changed that definition to turning from your sin. That is not the Bible definition of the word repent. Words mean things. The word repent means to change your mind. I have to repent. I have to change my mind in order to get saved. What do I have to change my mind about? I have to change the, my mind about the fact that uh, I have to change my mind about who is God. Jesus is God. Oh, it's not, it's not a whole bunch of different, there's one God, his name is Jesus. I have to change my mind about me. I think I'm pretty good and I'm, I'm going to work my way to heaven. No, you better change your mind about that. You're never going to work your way to heaven. You deserve to go to hell. Woo, woo, I've changed my mind about that. I always thought I, I, I could earn my way to heaven. No, you have to change your mind about that. You understand? Yes, you have to repent. You have to change your mind about who God is. You have to change your mind about who you are. You have to change your mind about how to get to heaven. And you have to realize the only way you're going to get to heaven is by calling on Jesus Christ. But the, the, the doctrine of the Pharisees make it difficult to get to heaven. The doctrine of the Pharisees, and I don't have time to go through the rest, but, but the doctrine of the Pharisees takes advantage of those that are in need. Jesus said this, he said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense you make long prayers. Look, look, God's word doesn't take care, doesn't take advantage of those who are in need. The doctrine of Pharisees will focus on material possessions rather than spiritual truth. Jesus said, Woe unto you, blind guides. Look, Jesus rebukes them for focusing on material things. The doctrine of the Pharisees will focus I on tithing and not on judgment and mercy. The idea of judgment is discerning what's going on and having mercy with a person's life. Oh man, look at that person. Man, um, and caring about them even though they don't meet up to your particular expectations. The doctrine of the Pharisees will focus on outward and not inward. He says, he says you, you, you cleanse first the outside of the cup and the platter, but, the, but the, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you. Uh, he's, I, I love this. He says, woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whited sepulchers, nice polished tombstones, which indeed appear beautiful on the out, on outward, but if you dig down, they're full, they're within, they're full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you're full of hypocrisies. That is the doctrine of the Pharisees. I've got a couple more that I, I'm going to give to you. Denies, the, the doctrine of the Sadducees denied the supernatural and the miraculous. They said, hey, we don't believe in angels. We don't believe in spirits. We don't believe that in the resurrection. We don't believe in any of that. Cody said it last week. He said, that's why they're sad, you see. They don't believe in any of the things that they should, but that, that are, are eternal, that are, that, are, that are real. So, these are the doctrines of the scribes, or the doctrines of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And he says, you beware of that. Now, why is he telling us to beware of that? Because these things can creep into our lives. And we can, without really thinking about it, we can get to a point where we're judging somebody. Oh, well, you think that person's really saved? I mean, after all, 
they, got, they, they, they prayed a prayer and, look, I haven't seen him in church for three weeks. Hey, h- how did you do when you first got saved? And, and you don't know that person's background. There may be a major, major change in that person's life. You just don't know it because you don't know how bad off he was. God knows how bad off you were. We can fall into that. So how do I avoid the false doctrines? Number one, study the word of God. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Study the word of God, and let the word of God teach you what is right and what is wrong. And then number two, the word of God, the Bible says, is profitable for doctrine. It'll mature us. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, and verse 16, and that verse is there, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. You want the right, you want to know what's right, you want to be corrected about wrong thinking, then get in the Word of God. The Word of God it needs to be part of your daily habit, just like you eat. How often do you eat, Kyle? A lot. <laughs> I thought he was going to say three times, two times. Uh, Rob, how, 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 yeah, I know, I've seen you. Don't ever put a donut in front of that man. Any kind of donut, but especially a coconut donut or an apple fritter. Don't, these are, listen, we eat all the time. This is a Baptist church, and we, we do that sometimes. Listen, sometimes we eat for nourishment. Other times we eat for pleasure. Sometimes you'll need this just for nourishment. Other times you read it for pleasure. But the fact of the matter is, whether it's pleasure or whether it's nourishment, you need this. You need it in your life. You need to schedule a time in your life where you're in that book. You need to be in church as often as possible where you're being fed the word of God, Sunday morning, Sunday night, or Wednesday night, so that you're not being led astray by false prophets and by the doctrine of the Pharisees. Look. So, here's the last question, and we'll end with this. We've got a third point we've got to get to, but we'll do that next week. Why should we beware? Why should we beware? Here's why. Because it seems slight and unimportant, but leaven, you put it in and it grows. You take a little bit of leaven, you put it in, it's all through the bread. It's all through the bread. You need to understand. That's why you need to guard yourself from false doctrine and guard yourself from false teachers because a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Leaven grows gradually. It just slowly gets into the system like poison, and it just gets all the way through. Leaven grows certainly. If you get leaven there, it will grow. It will grow. And leaven affects the entire loaf. It gets all through everything. Then understand this, that once it's in, the whole loaf is affected for its life. Stay away from the leaven of the Pharisee, which is the doctrine, which is hypocrisy, which is self-righteousness. Stay away from it. Beware. 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 Satan's out to get you. And times are not going to get better. You're going to hear all sorts of lies, all, not just from the church, not just from, the, from Christians or false prophets. You're gonna, you hear them all the time from everywhere. Check out what the Word of God says and direct your life by its truth. Father, thank you for your Word. Help us to take your truth. Help us to apply it to our lives. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I want to ask a question. Do you know for sure if you died right now, you'd go to heaven? If you do, would you slip up your hands as a testimony to that? Thank you. You can put your hands down. Maybe you don't. Maybe you'd say, man, I might have been listening to some false prophets. I, I don't know for sure I'm going to heaven. If that's you, I'd like to pray for you. I won't embarrass you or point you out. But you'd say, preacher, pray for me. I don't know for sure I'm going to heaven. 
Nobody's looking around but me. I just want to pray for you. Anybody like that? I don't know for sure I'm going to heaven. Please pray for me. Okay, I see a hand that just went up. I'll pray for you. Anybody else? Pray for me. I don't know for sure if I die, I go to heaven, but I'd like to know that. Right now, you can pray this prayer. In fact, I'm going to pray for that one who raised their hand. Father, I pray for that one who raised their hand. You know that person's heart. I don't. Father, uh, that, that, that hand said, I don't know for sure I'm going to heaven. Pray for me, and I want to pray that before he leaves here tonight, he'll know he's going to heaven. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, you, I want you to know this. If you raised your hand, or even if you didn't, maybe you're not the person that raised your hand, but you're not sure you're going to heaven, mm-hmm. you can pray this simple prayer. Jesus will hear you, and he will take you to heaven when you die. All you have to do is say to him, Dear Lord Jesus, and mean this from your heart, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that you are God, and I know that I am a sinner, and I don't deserve to go to heaven. But I believe you died for me, and you rose from the dead so I could have eternal life. And the best way I know how, right now, I call on you and ask you to be my Lord and my Savior and my God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying for me. Help me now to live for you. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you just did that, you're a child of God, and I congratulate you and welcome you to the family of God. Father, thank you for the privilege of being able to share your word tonight. I pray for that one who raised their hand again. I pray, Father, I just, I, I just hope in my heart that he prayed to trust you and that he's a child of God now. And I pray, Father, he'll grow in you. Help us all to grow in you. Help us to beware of false prophets. Help us to take this truth that's written in these papers and beware of of the doctrines of the Pharisees so that we might honor you. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, God bless you. You're dismissed.